My name is Kurt Baumgartner. I'm a principal security researcher for Kaspersky Labs Global Research and Analysis Team. I've been a part of the team since 2010, and I work out of Boulder, Colorado, USA. Today I talked about uh, a subgroup, uh, a Russian-speaking cyber espionage group. We call them APT, uh, and their activity. It's a longer-running group. Uh, it's a very curious kind of set of activity because they, they, their lineage is in sort of a, a longer running group called Sophacy, and they were, their malware was cr clearly related to another group called Black Energy. But in 2005, they kind of set out on their own, and they've, they've created this unusual, uh, at least for these Russian-speaking groups, this unusual way of moving forward with agile development, with pushing out managed code, with pushing out more malware and unusual types of languages and, and building out unusual features into their code. Um, and really what they do is they, they're a spear phishing machine. They attempt to uh, uh, steal credentials, credentials of all kind. And I called this talk the Zebrasi's Malware Salad. Uh, or multi-language malware salad, in part because a salad is a course that comes before the entree. And so they really, they're, they're kind of first in, they gain access, they maintain that access, and they do it again and again. And they've been doing that for at least five years now. Uh, so we expect to see more of it. Um, I expect to see their targeting and their target base grow. I expect to see them using additional languages. I, I mentioned on stage maybe Rust, maybe Python. We'll see more of them in 2019 with more uh, new innovative uh, sets of code. Yeah, who should be concerned about Zebrasi? Their targeting has varied for the past five years. So it it's changed from uh, government and uh, military related to media to uh, scientific to research law enforcement intelligence community it's it's exploded and in 2000 towards the end of 2018 um, it it the volume really increased. So when we first started watching them, they were more interested in targets in, say, Eastern Europe. Uh, and then later on into 2015, 2000, through 2017, it started spreading out. We saw, saw more targets throughout Central Asia, Middle East, and uh, even later into 2018, we've been hearing about more, uh, more targeting in Western Europe in, on Western targets. So yes, it still continues with with uh, embassies and diplomats and government agencies, but it's mushroomed out into a whole different set of profiles. You know, the effectiveness of Zebrasi is always surprising to me, in part uh, because more recently, for example, they have been spear phishing people and send, sending down Go uh, downloaders and code that's written in Go. And Go is something uh, that creates these files that are huge. They're five meg. And sometimes these guys will spearfish people with files that are anywhere from two to four megabytes. And they still, the recipients still run the attachments. So the spear phishing is successful. Um, and yes, I think education is a real part of that. Although the emails are crafted in such a way that it's related to their work and there is and the icons are changed and the file extension looks looks normal so there are things that the team does to uh, to convince end users or to convince their targets to run their malware but with numbers that I see, uh, maybe half of the time, recipients are opening up these attachments and running them on their machines. So yes, uh, targets and victims really need to learn a little more about what's really behind their email and, and how they're getting spearfished. So yeah, I work out of the US and uh, I work out of Boulder, Colorado. It's kind of, it's in the Rockies. We ski, it's a good spot. Um, but uh, yeah, I've worked there for 10 years now. And um, when I joined, uh, at the time, exploit kits and mass exploitation was a real issue. Um, so 
websites were being compromised and thousands of users who were being redirected to exploits and um, and becoming victims of these of these financially motivated schemes. Um, we don't see quite so much of that anymore. There are more strategic websites being compromised and we do they're they're being called watering holes and that's still going on but we don't see sort of the mass exploitation that we had seen in the past and i sort of expect that kind of thing to continue um in in certain ways the targeting and the the hyper focus that uh some of these attackers have on their on their targets um is going to continue and when you look further down the line um, I expect some of this, whether it's the targeting or the build out of their code or whatever it is to be guided or possibly run by uh, neural networks and machine learning paradigms that are producing code or, or guiding the attacks to evade defenses. So I think that's a real thing. Um, and I think attackers are going to start implementing that uh, in the years to come. Um, as far as IoT goes, I think that's an exploding problem. Um, I think security is still continues to be very immature when it comes to the Internet of Things space, and for the years to come, that's going to be a real Achilles heel for many networks for many years to come. Oh, how, uh, well, I my first SaaS was in Cyprus. Um, I wasn't even working for the company yet, and uh, I, it was amazing. I loved it. Um, we were uh, we we stayed down near down on a beach, and uh, at the time it was. Uh, I think we had some external people like myself, and then there was an internal part of the program, and it, that's changed since then. Um, also, it was invite only, and uh, and mostly. Kaspersky engineers. It was almost all Kaspersky people. Um, uh, so that's changed. Um, but I've been to everyone except for one in Malaga because of the birth of a daughter. That overlapped and she takes priority. One word, that's it's really tough. Let me think. Let me think. It's still something I look forward to every year. It, it's the best thing of the year. So, uh, or the best one of the year. Um, by far, it's amazing. <laughs> 2028. Um, you know, I'm hoping, and I've been discussing this, that somehow as, as it grows and as it becomes more and more of a hit and more exciting every year, that we, that we do something um, to sort of make it more green. So whether it's with badges that we can recycle or they're compostable or more uh, webinar driven attendance so people aren't flying uh, all over the planet and burning all this stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping we can do something and lead, lead the way on that uh, before all these other conferences like in California that attracts so many people and just burns so much fuel and all the all the stuff that goes in backpacks that just gets thrown out the door. These, our gifts, get used all the time. So we right now don't have that issue. But um, yeah, just making a lighter footprint with our conference would, I think, be really nice to see. Yeah.